Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live and Danoon Institute of Biblical Research. And look, I really just to this evening, I thought to have a heart to heart uh, with my friends around the world, whether you're Jewish, or Christian, Muslim, whatever you may be. Uh, I wanted to have a heart to heart from some of the biblical scriptures of the New Testament, as well as that of uh, the Old Testament. And if, if you're Muslim, I trust it'll be a blessing for you or Hindu, whatever you might be. But I want to talk to you a little bit about things that are really overlooked when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, who he really was, and some of the amazing things that he did in the last portion of his earthly ministry. And um, I say these things, especially in light, because I see how that so many have left their first love. They've left uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the burden for souls to win souls to Christ, whether it be Jewish souls or, or if it be just people that are in need of his mercy and grace regardless. Uh, but it's, I say this, too, because I've watched the, the what has crept into the church the doctrine uh, of futurism. And look, I'm not to say there's not scriptures that's yet to be fulfilled. I'm a firm believer that there are scriptures that are going to be fulfilled still yet as well. But when I say futurism, I'm talking about prophecies like Zechariah 8, uh, you know, taking a whole 10, taking all the skirt of him that is a Jew and saying that, you know, we hear that God is with you, we'll go with you. Uh, things like that, uh, you know, looking for the house of Israel, the, the lost tribes of Israel still to come home. And over in Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter clearly shows you they've already come home, although it was a remnant, as Isaiah prophesied, yet it took place. So there's so much that has crept in what we call the Schofield Darby Doctrine that it has blinded the believers in getting the message of Jesus Christ out to our Jewish friends all over the world uh, and, and to the to the people period of the nations that the gospel has just been uh, sidetracked, but especially to the Jewish people, it's been sidetracked. And of course, there's been a lot of infiltration in the church uh, to help really to, to make sure that ministers and Christians are blinded uh, into looking to a Zionist future with an antichrist that's going to be ruling on the throne in Israel. So, Let's start with one of the most simplest passages of all, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but th that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is, con is not, con excuse me, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's one of the parts of this passage that is so overlooked. Is that very verse 19. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Now, I want to really look at some very fascinating things that we have so often overlooked um, in the last hours of the, the Lord Jesus's life, the things that he did. Uh, if we consider the Passover uh, being one, you know, and uh, but I want to take you specifically uh, to start with over a very simple comment that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Something to really think about, right? Uh, maybe we'll back up to verse uh, 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that asks, seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? Whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? 
You know, I did a message not too long ago on this very subject about Jesus when he fed the multitude. You know, he, he feeds the multitude both bread and fish. And we know why he feeds the bread, because we know that Jesus, when he talks in another place, he, he speaks about, let me see if I can find that for you real quick here. Um, yeah, it's over in the book of John, the gospel of John chapter six, uh, beginning around verse 49. I'll back up to verse 46. Now that any man has, uh, not that any man has seen the father, save he which is of God, he has seen the Father. Very, very, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat men in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. My flesh, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me even shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things he said in the synagogue and taught them in Capernaum. And many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And then Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it and said unto them, Doth this offend you? And what if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up uh, where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. And Jesus knew from the beginning. See, he knew from, let's see, I think I lost my place here. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, let's see. Okay, prophet of nothing. Okay, yes, okay. But there be some believe not. And Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. Now, the whole point that I wanted to show you, though, is that Christ was that bread of life. And we find out that when we're reading this, you know, as, as, as it was said, stated earlier in, in the passage there that I was trying to share with you, is that Jesus was, um, you know, he asked the question in Matthew chapter 7, verse 10, or if he asked a fish, will he give him a serpent? Right? Now, what was this all about in the first place? Why would Jesus even do that? Well, you have to go back and, and understand everything that was happening in the life of, of Christ was happening for a reason. And it was a message, a clear message to the Jewish people to show who he was and also to show that the mercy of God. See, Israel, Israel wanted a law. So Israel was under the law. And when Moses came and delivered them out from under the bondage in Egypt, you know, this is when they always want, they, 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 they had to have law, 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 law. Well, God showed them they couldn't live by the law. All right, let's, so let's go back. Let's look at the history of this and we'll, see, we'll understand a little bit better why Jesus makes the statement he says. In Numbers chapter 11, uh, this is one of, the, one of the places where they're already murmuring over the manna. God gives them manna so that they can live naturally, physically, while they're in the wilderness journey, and they complained about that, right? In Numbers chapter 11, let's start with verse 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched, and he called the name of the place Tibera. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? 
We remember the fish, which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And the manna was a coriander seed, and the color thereof is the color of a, of a bedelium. All right, we won't go into the way the manna was. But the point was they were not content with the manna. So they wanted fish. And it doesn't just end there. What's really fascinating, if you continue on in this story here, um, over in Numbers, we can go to, I think it's chapter 21. Yeah, here we go. Chap Numbers chapter 21. Again, they go into complaining all over again, right? And uh, let's back up to verse 1, or let's see. Verse, verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much and discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Where, where, uh, wherefore have you brought us out into Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. Again, they're complaining about the manna, right? And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee, and pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon the pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man and he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. You see, so they wanted the fish in the earlier part of the chapter. And then they come down here around Numbers 21. They're complaining about the manna all over again. And the serpent got them. And if you look at what's going on with Jesus when he comes down, for example, and he goes to feed the multitude, and he sits them down, and as he goes to feed the multitude, what does he do? He does, he takes, and this is earlier in his ministry, but let, let me just see if I can find that for you real quick, right? Um, when Jesus goes to feed the multitude, Trying to get the right combination of, of words here. Um, when he goes to feed that multitude, uh, here we go, right here we have it here. And we got this in Matthew. There's, of course, you can get it in many of the many of the different gospels. We'll just go to Matthew 14 there. Um, but Jesus said to them, they need not to depart. Okay, he wanted, he wanted to feed them. So they, they took, and I think they have two, two little fishes, and a little, guy, a little guy's got the bread. Let's see. Two fish, and looking up to heaven, he broke, he blessed it. He gives them to, he gives us to his disciples, has them pass it all out, right? And, and they, um, and of course, the people were fed, and he fed a multitude. I forget, was it like 3,000? Or uh, one place is, three, I think, 3,000, another place, 5,000. Um, but, What's interesting about this, he feeds them both the bread and, of course, the fish. So what was Jesus actually doing when he did this? You see, when, they, when their forefathers were in the wilderness journey, all they did was complain about the manna. And they ended up getting bit by serpents. Now, there is another place, and I think it's right after this. Um, hang on one second here. Um, hmm, kind of losing my, not losing the thought, but losing the, because uh, I was wanting to find where they come back later. Um, oh, I remember. If I can spell the words right here. Always typing in the wrong letter, and that's what messes everything up. Oh, oh, I spelt the word wrong. There we go. Here we go. Aha, here we go. Got it. 
Okay, they were dollar. Okay, they were all eat. Okay, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Seven basketfuls. Trying to find that place where Jesus talks about where they come back. Hmm. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. John chapter 6, verse 26 as well. Let me back up to verse 25. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when, whence camest thou hither? Jesus answered, and said, answered them and said, Verily I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. All right. Now, the point is, is Jesus was showing to the children of Israel. He knew and, you know, what had happened. Of course, everybody knew, but he knew what had happened uh, back there in the wilderness journey. They complained about the manna. So not only does he is he able to bring in the bread and create it in their very sight, but he doesn't even leave undone what their forefathers had complained about. And that was like in Numbers chapter 11, we remember the fish. So he gave them the fish as well. You see, he was showing to the children of Israel that the Heavenly Father is a good God and will give even that what you ask for. But he wanted them to be able to go beyond that. He didn't have to worry about giving them a, a serpent or anything because why? The serpents were already among them as it were. As Jesus said about the Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, or specifically about the Pharisees, when he says, you are of your father, the devil, and the works that he, do, that he does, you'll do also. He even calls them serpents, vipers. They already had the serpents among them. They didn't have to worry about that. They already had it. But there were so many things that were going on uh, at this time, especially near his crucifixion, that I have just always found amazing. And of course, this whole thing about the, 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 the fish and stuff was one of them. But, you know, another one is the, is, is the veil of the temple being rent in twain. When he died, and, and this is something I wanted to really share, share with you guys as well. Um, when we look at the veil of the temple... Right at the time, because every, everything, everything that was going on at the time of Jesus's death and resurrection, there were so many things that are overlooked, and especially for the Jewish people. If you happen to be Jewish and you're listening to this broadcast, I really wish you would take this very seriously into heart. You know, we could take, for example, the crown of thorns that was plaited and put upon his head. Uh, and a lot of people think it's the Roman soldiers that did this. But if you look carefully... Um, at the Hebrew Matthew, it seems to indicate it's the, it's the uh, temple guards that actually plaited the crown of thorns and put it on his head. And so therefore, they would have been Jewish and not, um, uh, not Roman. And that could be argued. I mean, like I said, you know, I mean, I'm not making that as a doctrine. I just think it's kind of interesting. But nonetheless, the reason why the crown of thorns was placed upon his head was because God spoke to Moses at Mount Horeb from the burning bush. And that burning bush is Eight Sinai, all right, which is a thorn bush. Now, interestingly enough, if you remember, when God speaks to Moses at Mount Horeb, that bush is on fire, but it's not consumed. Literally, in Hebrew, it says not eaten. Okay, lo chel. The tree is not consumed. And Moses wants to turn around to see what this great sight is that, that, that he's watching there. And, uh, and of course, then the angel of the Lord spoke from, the, and then we find out that God speaks from the midst of the bush to Moses. You know, Moshe, Moshe, you know, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. We, we read, we know the story very well. All right. But why then do they plate the crown of thorns and put it on his head. They don't realize what they're doing, but they're literally taking and putting on the, uh, as a crown 
for Christ that he was the very king of kings that spoke to Moses at the burning bush. Right from the same type of tree, they platted a crown of thorns that God spoke to Moses to. And of course, when we see in the, in the, in the Hebrew language there, it was from a, um, let me just see if I, I don't know if I can find it fast enough for you here. But, um, but if we were to look at that, when we, when we see that crown of thorns was placed on Moses' head, um, I'll tell you what, to save time, I won't go into that right now because we'll be here all night. Uh, but when they platted that crown of thorns and placed that upon his head, that was a, a sign that he was the same God because it was, the, it was the, 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 the angel of his presence is what we read about. Now, God is not an angel. We know that. What is the angel of his presence? It was the pillar of fire is what represents that word. The word angel is like messenger. So this was where God was speaking from the midst of that bush, just as when Christ was, was on the cross and he spoke out in that unknown tongue and said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So it's just fascinating how there's so many different things that take place. And, uh, and, and a lot of times we just overlook it. So anyway, uh, Matthew chapter 27, it says here, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. That's what I wanted to share with you right there. We, we one, when he gave up the ghost, not only did the veil of the temple was it torn from the top to the bottom? But we often kind of overlook the fact that the rocks ran. Isn't that interesting? Right there, we get that word, the rocks ran. And yet that, just like the veil being ran, it's another amazing, amazing sign that is overlooked over and over and over again. Right? Because the rocks being torn like they were, that's the exact same thing that happened uh, when God cleaved the rocks, right? Uh, I'm trying to think of which way. I actually had found a scripture on this a little bit earlier there. Let me just see if I can find it again. I think it's over in the book of Psalms there. Um, and, and by the way, it is, uh, let's see. Yeah, here it is. Psalm 78, 15. Because it's when when the you know when he gave up the ghost, not only was the veil rent, which represented what? Because later the Roman soldier will pierce his side, which will pierce his heart, where the water and the blood separates and comes out, which was just a, was a sign, and that sign actually was for the little woman at the well that met him. And I'll go into that in just a few minutes. There is a sign to her that he was that living water. Okay, he was that living water of life. And so when the veil was rent, what happened? The spirit of God that left Christ was leaving also the Holy of Holies. Because that same spirit of God that was in the Holy of Holies was in Christ, in a human body. And the rocks being torn. If you look at Psalm uh, 78, 15, he claved the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. Right? That's why it actually talks about when Christ was there, the rocks rent. Again, it was another sign to the children of Israel that he was the very same God that had met the children of Israel in that wilderness journey. He was the same God that spoke to Moses out of a burning bush. He was the same God that rent the rock. And of course, in Psalm, it literally uses the word rocks, plural, just like it does over in Matthew, the, the rocks were rent, they were ripped open. But this time, what happens? When the rocks were rent on the day of Calvary, there was not water coming out of them. They didn't have to because when the Roman soldier pierced his side, that water came out of him and separated from his blood. And it showed that he was the rock itself from the wilderness journey. 
That's why when he was speaking to that little woman at the well and she, he says, bring me a drink. She's a Samaritan, right? She said, he says, bring me a drink. And she says, sir, the well is deep. And or no, she says, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. We have no dealings with one another, right? That's what she says there. Jesus said, if you knew it was that was talking to you, you would ask me for a drink and I'd give you water. You don't have to come here for anymore because I'll give you water. And they're just paraphrasing that will flow from the valley. Well, they get into this kind of this argument, this theological argument about, you know, uh, or she does, you know, uh, you say, you Jews, you say we should worship on uh, that, uh, in, in Jerusalem and we believe we can worship on this mountain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then Jesus finally says to her, go get your husband and come here. She says, I have no husband. He said, you told the truth. You had five and the one you're living with now is not yours. Wow. She said, come see a man who's told me everything that ever happened. And I mean, it was amazing, right? And then Jesus says to her, when he gives her that sign, I give you water that you don't have to come here and drink no more. It just totally gave her a sign what to look for. And on the day of Calvary, when his side was pierced, you see, the veil had already been rent in half. The rocks were already just, just split in half there. But then she saw, I believe she was there that day, then she saw that water coming out of his side, separated from his blood. Everything he did, everything that Jesus did when he was on this earthly journey, so spoke to who he was. He was here showing mercy. You see, in the wilderness journey, they murmured and complained about the manna. They said, I wish to God that we had the fish and the melons and the cucumbers. Give us flesh to eat is what they said, right? So when Jesus came and he was there, he multiplied the bread to show that he was the same God that gave him man on the wilderness journey. And because he knew and remembered what happened then, he gave them the fish as well. Why? Because he's a good father. A loving father. And that's why he asked the question. Which one of your fathers, of you fathers, if you ask him bread, would you give him a stone? Or would you give him a serpent? And then Moses, because of their sins, because that's what the law was doing, right? The law brought that on upon them. But Christ was mercy. Moses had to raise up the, the serpent, on a, take a brazen serpent, put it on a pole so that they could live. And this is why Christ had to be placed on a cross. And when the veil of the temple was rent, the Spirit of God departed but he didn't just it didn't just depart he made access for the spirit of almighty god that dwelled within the holy of holies to come back and live in you that's why he told the woman at the well if you knew it was it was talking to you you'd ask me for a drink and i would give you water that you don't have to come here anymore he was talking about the life that was in him. Just like we have in Genesis, where it says, He says, He breathed, he breathed upon his nostrils, and man became a living soul. That life that was in Almighty God that could breathe upon Adam and cause him to be a living soul was embodied in a human being called Jesus Christ. That's why after his resurrection, what does he do? He breathes upon his apostles and he says, receive ye the gift of the Holy Ghost. Just like it was with Adam. Everything he did was for a reason. The most beautiful message of all time, the love and mercy of Jesus Christ, is right now. 
And unfortunately, when the people are asking for the bread of life right now, people are giving them the serpent. Israel doesn't need a serpent. They don't, they had the serpent doctrine already. The Pharisaic doctrine is a serpent doctrine, and they've had it for the last 2,000 years. Do you realize that the Jewish people need the manna? They need the fish. They need the bread of life. Why would you give them a serpent? Soon, things are going to change in this world. We have very little time to try to witness to people. And unfortunately, sadly, the Christian people need a witness greater even than the Jewish people seem to need the witness because they're the ones that are being bewitched. And instead of asking God for the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ, they're embracing the serpent on the brass pole. They've taken an idol. I trust this has been a blessing to you in some way. And I want to thank you for listening. Thank you for your support as well. There's many of you that support this work that we do, and we appreciate that. We are living in a very late hour. If you want to support the ministry, you can. You can visit our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org, or you can go to uh, or you can buy mail here in Sunbright, Tennessee, where we live at. Uh, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. Please keep us in prayer. And we'll be praying for you as well. I know that this is a very trying time like no other time in the history of the world. We are headed to a new world order faster than you could ever imagine. And all the steps are being put in place right now for that very purpose. So be in prayer. We'll be praying for you. Thank you for listening. I'm Stephen Benoon. Sorry, it's a little chopped up. I, I, I wish I'd have had everything already up. I need to get internet out here. I'm in a little barn. Uh, we're turning into an office there just so I can kind of film in quietness with you. Uh, but pray for us that we can get, um, get this all hooked up out here so where I could actually lay all the scriptures out and show them to you as I, I tell you about them as well. God bless you and good night, and we'll talk to you again soon.